sound because it's one of the rarest sounds you'll he hear in, in Britain today and if any of you know what it is and particularly if you've heard it in the last couple of years you'll know how lucky you are because it belongs to the turtle dove. The turtle dove, here we are, the two turtle doves my true love gave to me at Christmas. Um, they're the stuff of Shakespeare, of Chaucer, they're embodied in our DNA and yet they're about to go extinct in the UK in the next 10 or 15 years according to the RSPB. That's an absolutely catastrophic loss. When I was um, growing up in the 1960s, there were 125,000 pairs of turtle doves crooning away in the hedgerows. To me, it was as familiar as a cuckoo in the summer. And now we've lost them. Uh, we've probably got a few thousand left before they completely disappear. Um, the reason um, for their loss is complicated. They're an African migrant, so they've got a lot of obstacles on the way um, from coming, flying to us in the summer from Africa, droughts, weather, and of course then they've got to uh, cross the firing squads of the Mediterranean. So they've got to cross Malta and Spain and Italy and even France where they're shot by the hundreds of thousands every year. But the, the number is declining in Europe, but nowhere is it declining as rapidly and as catastrophically as it has declined in the UK. And the reason is this. The wholesale change of our landscape since the, since the Second World War, every inch of our land that is um, a, a possibly allowed to be um, turned into agriculture is, we've ploughed every single inch. And this is what our farm looked like uh, when we took over in the 1980s. Uh, this is where we live, Nep Castle um, in West Sussex. It's about 44 miles south of here, um, underneath the Gatwick stacking system in the busiest, most populated area of southeast England. And when we took over, we inherited a loss-making farm, arable and dairy. It was already making huge loss, uh, but we inherited from my husband Charlie's grandparents. We just assumed it was loss-making because they hadn't invested and they weren't up with the times with all the latest technology. So we did what all good farmers are supposed to do. We invested in bigger machinery. We, um, uh, we bought in different types of crops. We bought in better, bigger dairy cows. We put more fertilizer, more pesticide, more herbicide, more fungicide on the land. We, we um, invested in infrastructure. We amalgamated dairies. We even diversified into ice cream and uh, sheep's milk and yogurt. And still we made a loss. 17 years later, we, we had an overdraft of one and a half million and our backs were absolutely against the wall, even with subsidies. And the reason is this, Sussex clay. I don't know if anyone knows the low wield, but if you do, you'll be familiar with this. It is like unfathomable porridge in winter and in summer it just bakes hard as concrete. I think the Inuit are supposed to have dozens of words for, for different types of snow, but in Sussex, in the old dialect, we have over 30 words for mud. It, this is how, what governs our lives. And so in a wet year like this past winter has been, we can't get heavy machinery onto the land for six months, which makes us completely uncompetitive with lovely, loamy, beautiful soils around Chichester where we look longingly. Um, um, to no avail. So after 17 years of intensive arable and dairy farming, we were desperately looking for alternatives. And we came across this amazing guy uh, called Franz Vera. He's a Dutch ecologist, and just about the time when we were giving up the farm in 2000, his book, Grazing Ecology and Forest History, was published in English. And it was making shockwaves amongst the scientific and co conservation and ecologists um, that, that we knew. Because what France is saying is that in all our imaginings of what our temperate zone Europe would have looked like before human impact, we've completely forgotten about the huge herds of roaming animals that would have been here with, before us, that would have been driving the habitat um, of, of early Europe. We've forgotten about the aurochs, the tarpan, the bison. We've forgotten about elk. We've forgotten about wild boar. 
beavers by the million. These would have been governing our ecology, driving systems, and we've completely forgotten about them. So Europe would have looked a lot more like Africa, like the Serengeti, or even the Great Plains of America before they lost the bison, than our kind of conceptual idea of a closed canopy forest, for example. So what France is saying is that if you want to uh, recover some biodiversity, you can introduce some of these animals, and they will create habitat, and uh, it's almost like, like, like injecting dynamism into a flat landscape. Suddenly there's energy there again, and it's like pulling a glider up into the air. Ex extraordinary things start to happen, things start to fly. And so this is what we did. Uh, we sold the farm machinery, sold the dairy cows, we cleared our overdraft, thank God, and um, we, we started um, taking up fences, interior fences, 250 miles of fences, imagine what that had cost to maintain as farmers. And uh, we, uh, we, we, we took out gate posts and gates. We had a fantastic time smashing up Victorian drains that had been rather ineffectual at taking the water off our land and just let the water sit where it wanted to be. So already we were creating wetlands and seeing interesting things happen. And then we ring-fenced the whole lot and started to introduce animals. Now, because we've um, exterminated the aurochs and the tarpan and almost exterminated the bison, um, they aren't around for us to introduce, but we can use domesticated animals as their proxies. And so we introduced Old English longhorn cattle as our proxy for the aurochs. And uh, these are amazing animals, but what they're particularly doing in our system is uh, they can carry 230 different varieties, different species of seed in their gut. So it's nature's ingenious way of moving flora around a landscape. They eat in one place and then they um, dung it out in the other and the, the seeds fall in a perfect little pile of compost ready to take off again. They have completely different, uh, they browse and graze so they have big impact on the landscape. And we introduced Exmoor ponies um, as a proxy for the tarpan, for the original horse. And again, this is a different mouth in the landscape, different ways of eating, different vegetation preferences. This one is eating um, thistles. Cattle don't like thistles. Um, it can stomach a lot, lot rougher grasses than a, than a cow can. So another mouth in the landscape doing dynamic things. And then we've got red deer, roe deer, and fallow deer. Again, more of a kind of suite of animals each with different preferences and, again, different disturbances. Particularly in the rut, these, these animals will turf up the, the soil with their, with their antlers. Um, and my favorite, the Tamworth pig, standing, standing in for the, for the wild boar. And it's amazing when you see these, these animals in a landscape free like this, because we're used to seeing them just in the confines of, of our kind of... Our, um, are sort of farming systems, intensive farming systems. And when you see them, I mean, these behave like hippos. They go to the bottom of the, of the lakes, they can hold their breath for about 120 seconds, and they're eating fresh, swan mo fresh water mussels from the bottom of the lake. How they knew they were there, I just don't know. But they're amazing, amazing things. Um, and what they're particularly doing, what's really important, is that they are rootling. And so this is exposing damp, bare earth so that seeds can colonize. Because if you just had this grass, heavy grass sward, that kind of resists seed penetration. So it's very difficult for things to colonize. And so what happens at NEP, very quickly, as you can see from my husband who has hardly moved, um, is you can see um, uh, seeds beginning to germinate in that open patch, like um, things like um, bird's foot trefoil, uh, scarlet pimpernel, red clover, black medic, um, fumitory, vetches, um, bindweed, all these things that we call weeds and we get rid of in the landscape. Plant life has a lot to say about this. Um, and, but these are our native flowering plants and they're beautiful and they've got these tiny little seeds on which so many other species depend. And yet these, these flora are also disappearing from our landscape because we refuse to tolerate them even in our gardens. But a lot of species depend on these seeds, including the turtle dove. And seven years ago, we heard our first turtle dove. Last year, we had 16 singing males. I mean, that's extraordinary from a baseline of nothing at all, coming from where we, we came from. And we are probably the only place in Britain where turtle dove numbers are actually climbing. 
Matthew Oates, who's the nature specialist at the National Trust, thinks we have more turtle doves on NEP on 3,500 acres than the National Trust does on 250,000 hectares. So this is absolutely extraordinary, especially if you think where we come from, this kind of clinical desert of farmland we were only 20 years ago. So this is what the turtle dove is seeing. This is us under, un, under farming. And this is the land beginning to heal itself as we let go and as we begin to rewild. And this is what the turtle dove sees from ground level, as it were. Scrub. Again, a habitat that we don't tolerate in our landscape today. In medieval times, this would have had hundreds of different uses. But now we look at this kind of landscape and we call it wasteland. But actually, it is one of the most biodiverse habitats there is. And we not, it's not just turtle doves. Turtle doves are finding a place to nest here in the thorny scrub. Um, so they've got the weed species to eat. They've got the clean water, difficult to find too in our landscape these days. But they've also got thorny scrub. But other things are finding us too. We've introduced none of these things. They've found us on their own. So we have Lester spotted woodpecker. We have um, ravens. We have snipe. We have woodcock. We have nightingales. Um, we have cuckoos. We have, um, we have peregrine falcons nesting in a tree. That's almost unheard of. And three days ago, we saw our first pair of goshawks. So it's absolutely extraordinary what is piling into net because we've got this habitat back. We've got all five species of UK owl. That, um, we've got um, 13 out of uh, 17 breeding species of UK bat, including two that are so rare, Becksteins and Barberstell, we hardly know anything about them at all. And we've got the purple emperor butterfly. We're now the biggest breeding hotspot in the UK for purple emperor butterflies, our biggest and our most dramatic butterfly, and one of the rarest. So one of the criticisms people keep levering, leveling at us um, when we started to do the project was the fact that we are not intensively farming anymore. But we are still producing food because we don't have any predators in the landscape. We still produce food. We cull the number of animals to keep them low so that there's a constant battle with vegetation succession. And we are now producing 75 tons of, I think, the most ethical meat you can possibly buy. And that's bringing in £120,000 a year, which was way more than anything we ever could have hoped to make under intensive farming. And that's because it's such low inputs. But we're also producing other services for the benefit of the public. Uh, we're sequestering carbon, we are cleaning water, we're purifying the air, we're mitigating against floods, and we're restoring soils. And that is hugely important. A couple of years ago, the NFU announced, the National Farmers Union announced, that we had only 100 harvests left in the UK. That's 100 harvests left because, uh, before we have no topsoil left in which to sow anything. And that's because our soil is so degraded that it just blows away with the wind or it washes out to sea. And that is catastrophic. So rather than being seen as the enemy of farming, which rewilding often is, I think it's, it's the ally. It's farming's greatest ally. And this is what's going to be really interesting post-Brexit, I think. Because when we have to start negotiating how much we're going to pay, for, if we're going to pay for farm subsidies at all, or how we're going to use our land, these factors are all going to come into play. And so we hope that there will be payments for the kind of ecosystem services, the benefits that this kind of land produces, and see it in, as working in tandem with farming. But perhaps what's been most interesting for me, I think, is on this journey into rewilding, is what it's done to us psychologically, my husband and I, um, from being farmers to doing this kind of thing. And it's something that I think we're just beginning to realize how important wild places like these are to our psyche, to our, our very soul. It's something that um, E.O. Wilson calls, the great um, American biologist calls biophilia, it's that feeling for life that all human beings have. We've only been urban beings for a blip in our, in our evolution. So severing ourselves from nature is very risky and it has huge mental and physical impacts. But that feeling of hearing a turtle dove purring is something that I think we can all respond to. And so if there are all these benefits, um, brought about by rewilding the land like this, then why aren't we doing more of it? Why aren't we leaping at it? And I think part of the problem is one of aesthetics. 
We've grown up in a, in a, in a landscape that is um, highly managed. We've grown up in a culture that is very, it's a sort of Victorian corseted cu culture. We're control freaks. We panic at the thought of letting go. But this is what we need to do if we're going to allow these systems to happen. We have to sit back and let nature take the driving seat. We've got to learn not to be in control all the time. We've got to relax and let go. And we've got to be able to live with boom and bust cycles of nature and to allow free roaming animals in our landscape once again. So I think really rewilding is as much about learning to appreciate this sort of landscape and what it can bring us as it is about learning to rewild ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>